Hello, everybody. Happy New Year, I suppose, is the thing I should start with. Uh, welcome to 2019. Uh, welcome to 19C if you've been following the Twitter sphere and the like. Um, but yeah, it's obviously, I had a nice little break over Christmas. Hopefully, you did the same and had a safe and happy time if you celebrate Christmas or just had a break. Uh, I had, it's funny, uh, my partner Genevieve gave me this uh, lovely mug I'll hold up on the screen. Uh, it's not meant to represent Ask Tom, it's meant to represent the fact that uh, she often sends me requests for Oracle Assistant. She works at an Oracle shop. So, but I figured that could be some good Ask Tom merchandise. We get some Ask Tom stickers maybe on that and we could, uh, I imagine most IT professionals have a similar experience, either at work or maybe in their family life when your mother or sister or brother phones up and says the computer doesn't work or the fax machine's broken or the dishwasher stops working, that kind of stuff. That's my life anyway. So for New Year's, my, for New Year's, my resolutions, um, which are funny enough, we're not going to do any of those things today, so I've already failed, is um, I'm going to try to get more into things like uh, autonomous, Docker, Vagrant, virtual machines. Uh, I've got to the stage now where I've got so many versions of the database running on various machines around in my house, uh, just because we try to answer Ask Tom questions on the versions that people submit them on. But I figured if I could get it maybe in Docker or something, it should make it hopefully a bit more portable, compact, and also teach me some new tech. So hopefully you've set yourself a uh, resolution this year as well to learn some new tech. Uh, hopefully that's uh, why you're here, which should be cool. So let's have a look at what we're gonna do. So uh, you can all see that. So um, once again, just I did this last month as well. Just I'm trying to standardize the way people can get in touch with me. So they're all bit.ly links now for my blog, for my YouTube channel, for Twitter. It's always just bit.ly followed by the item in question, blog, YouTube, or Twitter, followed by dash Connor. Similarly, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, SlideShare. I'm trying to make it nice and simple for people to find out stuff or get in touch with me because part of my job is for people to get in touch with me. Uh, in particular, uh, I'm doing some talks, obviously, this year all over the place. So whenever I do talks nowadays, I'm doing my best to upload the slides shortly thereafter to SlideShare. Now, that seems to be the Oracle standard nowadays across the product managers, so I've adopted that. So you can see there that it's bit.ly slash slides here dash Connor. A few bits and pieces. We'll start with some bits and pieces. So first of all, unless you've been living under a rock, you'll know that Oracle Open World um, in London is going on at the moment. And if you're not in that vicinity, there's also one coming up, I think, next month in Dubai and the month after that, thereabouts in Singapore. So... If you're like many people, and that is you'd love to go to open world in San Francisco, but can't because A, it's a long way away, B, the timing's wrong, C, if you've ever paid for a hotel in San Francisco, you'll know what that is in terms of expense wise. Um, this is a good chance to go to it. There's smaller events, admittedly, but Singapore, if you're in Asia, uh, Dubai, if in the Middle East, and obviously the one in London today. So uh, all the reports I've heard coming back from friends there, they're having a whale of a time. Uh, myself, in terms of travel, I'll be heading off to Israel uh, next week, late next week, to, for a conference the week after, um, and then from Israel off to Rome. So if you're in Israel, in the Israel user group, they've been um, very organized and sending me some fantastic stuff about how the event's going to run. So if you're in Israel, please come along and say hello, come to my talks, but just have a chat as well. And similarly, if you're in Rome, please come along and say buongiorno, um, which is pretty much the extent of my Italian, but hopefully uh, we can do some dialogue in English. I'll also be in Bangalore in March for Oracle Code. So if you're um, part of the Indian community and you're in Bangalore, of which that's a huge IT presence, please come along to Oracle Code. It's a free event and say hello. Uh, what else have I got to talk about? Well, um, if you're interested, this is the travel I did last year. That's a bitmap, so it might take a while to get down the line um, onto your screens. That's the number of places I went to last year. And this wasn't me trying to do any showboating or anything. Just wanted to let you know that Part of myself, part of my remit as a developer advocate is to try and reach out not just to user groups, but to customers as well. So if you are a customer of Oracle, I assume you are if you're on the call or a part of a user group, and I'm in the vicinity um, of your sort of neck of the woods at some stage during 2019, please reach out. Um, I'd love to come talk tech. Uh, it's my job. I'd love to come along and hopefully uh, help you be more successful. That's the obviously my main objective, to help you be more successful. Um, what else? Oh, I also, oh, 
I bought a new microphone for, for Christmas. So hopefully you're getting lovely, clear quality sound. If you're not getting sound, then that just means I don't know how to use the microphone yet. Not to worry. So what are we gonna do tonight? We've got a few things to talk about. We've got index usage uh, now in the future. How to know if a SQL is valid. We'll talk about that soon. Uh, cursor sharing and adaptive cursor sharing. I've spent a fair few days this week trying to get my head around some of the interesting anomalies with this, which I thought I'd share with you because this came through as a question. Someone saying they didn't really understand what was going on or what the performance implications were. We'll have a quick chat about multiple block sizes on Exadata because block sizes is a topic we've already covered in the past. So we'll just touch on that again because it came in as a question. And hopefully we'll finish off with a little bit of exciting stuff, uh, which I alluded to if you follow me on Twitter. Uh, if you don't, you should follow me on Twitter, hopefully. So let's get straight into it. Let's talk about indexes first. Well, I'm going to have to keep an eye on the time. So yeah, we'll see if we can get it all through by 9 p.m. my time. Hopefully I can be nice and fast tonight because I've shifted the monitor around such that I cannot see the television because directly behind me on the TV is the Australian Open and Novak, no uh, Novak Jokovic is playing. So I've blocked it all out so I can focus 100% on the office hours. So let's talk about indexes. This is the question that came in. I read on the blog that 19C will automatically create indexes. Can you explain what this is? But more importantly, what are the options before 19C we're on 11, moving to 12. When should I create indexes? When should I drop indexes? That was the question. So, <laughs> Stephen's, my, my manager's giving me a hard time, but that's okay. That's par for the course. So here's the question. What, are, what can we do in terms of managing indexes in 19? Or what is, what is the, the features coming in 19? And what can we do if we're not on 19 just yet? So let's talk about when you should create indexes. And, and this is generally um, a problem that we all struggle with as DBAs because it's very rare, especially in the modern IT landscape, that you sit down and think about the way queries are gonna run at the design stage and when you know, the product is in development and you come up with a carefully crafted set of indexes. What tends to happen is, is you have a problem and you solve it by creating an index and the question is, well, should I have created it? Should I have created a different one? What are the side effects of that, etc. So let's talk about creating indexes. So here's a classic example. I'm doing an insert, I'm doing a big select statement from a huge table with a load date greater than sys date minus one. This is a fictional example, but it's the classic thing that comes across our, across our desk as DBAs in terms of here's a query, it's running slow, make it faster. This is the issue. You know, people get their, their, their familiar swirly timestamp. Um, I had to Google it. It's called an infinite progress indicator. And you, you know, you've lost that ability to think about this in the design stage. It's just like, this is a problem, fix it now. So let's put aside all the technology. Let's just think about as a DBA, what is actually best practice? You have a slow SQL, you think it can be improved with an index. Let's not talk about just slamming an index in, which I'll admit is probably our first port of call. Let's talk about what best practice should be. So the first thing you need to do is identify all those queries that are struggling. It might just be one, there might be 10. So the best way to do that is generally to monitor the SQL load over time or in the critical times that it's happening. So that could be an AWR report you're looking at or the top SQL report, any tool or simple set of queries at your disposal, and say V dollar SQL stats and the like, that lets you monitor and pick up a set of SQL statements that potentially need attention. Number two is then you wanna then go look at each of those individual SQLs and in particular, look at the leading columns on the predicates on those particular SQLs. It's no use just indexing whatever columns you want, obviously. You have to look at each SQL, consider the predicates, and then look at the leading columns for each of those predicates and then come up with a set of potential indexes to fix each of those SQLs. Then you need to consolidate it because you may come up with three SQLs as I put in the example there. One's doing where A equals something, one's doing where A and B equals something, and one's doing where A and B and C are doing something. You wouldn't probably create three indexes on a table if it had three bad queries running like that. You would most probably create an index on just A, B, and C. And therefore A would be pick up, the query on A would pick up the benefit the query on B would also pick up the benefit, and obviously the query on A, B, and C would pick up the benefit as well. So you actually have to do not just 
there's my predicates, slap an index on or think about an index. It's there's my predicates. Let's do some intelligent consolidation to come up with a smaller set of potential indexes. Now, here's where best practice comes in. This is what I, I've actually um, done this in a talk recently about some of the ways of creating indexes without actually creating indexes. Because to create an index is an enormously resource intensive task. And given that we're not entirely sure yet if those indexes are going to be good or bad, it seems a, a, a poor thing to do to go burn up you know, gigabytes or terabytes of temp table space creating indexes that might not be appropriate yet. So a common technique or best practice is to create those indexes in either unusable mode or in no segment mode. Um, no segment is something that probably most people aren't aware of, but uh, if you're in Israel in a week's time, I'll talk about that one. But what in effect we're doing is creating an index definition in the data dictionary only without actually going and physically instantiating that index. We're not actually creating the segment space and the segment to, under, to underpin that index. It's just a metadata definition. So obviously it can't actually be used to speed up queries yet because it isn't actually a real index. But there are tools inside Oracle to say, if we have the metadata definition for an index, I can run an execution plan on the assumption that index actually exists. So obviously we can't use it for a genuine execution, but we can actually get an execution plan, an explain plan based on these indexes that exist only as metadata. And the advantage of that is, is what we're really doing is saying, here's my potential SQLs that are problematic. We are now doing a validation step saying, if these indexes actually came into existence, are those SQLs actually going to use them? Because just because an index is there, doesn't mean the optimizer is going to pick them up. It does a costing and a cardinality decision to decide if the index is worth it. So having those indexes defined just as metadata lets you do this step, which is generate some explain plans for the problematic SQLs to see if those indexes are indeed actually worth building. Let's say for a bunch of those SQLs, um, this is saying, what are the statistics for a no segment index? Uh, that's a topic for another discussion, i.e. I'll be talking about that in Israel. Um, and once those slides become available, I'll do it in either a subsequent office hour session or I'll do a separate YouTube video on it as well. Um, because otherwise we'll get distracted and I'll run out of time and people will send me nasty, nasty tweets saying that I ran out of time like last month and the month before that and perhaps the month before that. My apologies. So now that I'm confident that the ex execution plan is going to give me the use of those index, I'm actually gonna go ahead and create it. This is the part where I actually am going to burn up a lot of resources, but I have increased confidence that that index is actually going to be beneficial. I'm still gonna create it as invisible. Now, the reason I'm gonna create it as invisible is if I just create an index normally, immediately it is available to every query in your system to use it. Now, that might make a whole lot of queries better, it might make a whole stack of queries worse. We don't know. We, at the moment, we're only focusing on those top, for example, 10 SQLs. So creating an index is an, is an, as invisible means nothing can see it yet. It's now physically instantiated as a genuine segment, but it doesn't actually available to the optimizer, which is quite useful. A uh, quick footnote, if you create a unique invisible index, it is visible to sessions because it'll still enforce uniqueness. So we're talking about here of indexes we're creating as non-unique and they're invisible. Now, if I'm doing best practice, I need to go grab each of those problematic SQLs that I found before using my monitoring and now actually run them. It's not good enough just to have the explain plan tell me it's going to use the index. I need to actually run the things to see, did I actually make things better? Because sometimes using an index in particular, for example, for a large range scan might actually make your query slower. So if I've got say 17 SQLs that I've identified as, as potentials, I need to go run each of those 17 SQLs and make sure that each one of them actually ran better. Ideally, all 17 will, but that may not always be the case. And that's where we get into step eight here, which is we need to decide on the worth of each of the indexes. What if, for example, creating one index makes three SQLs better that I've found, but actually makes three other SQLs in my list of potentials worse. Well, now I'm, I'm, I'm in a balancing act. Do I actually put the index on or not? Now, if it's really important to me that I actually have those three in SQLs that do benefit from an index, that they must go on, 
then I have to consider something a little bit more complicated, which is I could do this to ensure no regression. I would have the index on, it's still invisible, remember. I know that a certain subset of my SQLs are actually going to benefit. I will then go need to visit all the SQLs that will actually regress by adding that index and in some way manipulate them. For example, add a no index in to make sure they don't pick up that index when we actually make it visible. In that way, I'm sort of getting the best of both worlds. The, index, the SQLs that will benefit, they will benefit when I make this index visible. And then the SQLs that are gonna regress, when I do make the index visible, they're gonna have a hint which actually forces them not to use it. So they'll have the same behavior characteristics. Finally, after all that, we have that degree of confidence. We've eliminated the vast majority of risk associated with creating an index. So we make that index visible and then we're done. It's that simple. There is actually a 10 step process if you're going to follow best practice to actually create an index on a system. After that, after all that work, normally what happens then is you'll probably just go grab a coffee and relax, maybe take a little break and then you do then, then you start again. Because literally every time your system is running, you know, more queries come in, new queries come in all the time. You'd then now need to go, go back to step one and get, for example, the next 15 minute AWR report or the next hour's AWR report. However long it took you to do those 10 steps, you're now back to square one and off you go again. So that's best practice for creating an index. I'd be willing to wager, and I'll quite happily confess myself, that none of us do this. You know, that's what we should be doing because it eliminates risk and yet yields benefits, but we don't. We just, generally what happens is we throw the index on and we see what happens. And then if it all goes very, very pear-shaped, which is colloquialism for it goes bad, then we might drop that index off, for example, and start and scratch our heads. So this leads me on to the 19C offering that's coming out sometime this year. And that is, what if we could do that 10 step process automatically with no intervention? And that is the premise of 19C automatic indexes. We're looking at a system where the database itself will follow that 10 step process. Not just, oh, it'll see an SQL, see that it's bad, find some columns, slap an index on. It will follow that best practice of identify SQLs, identify columns for indexing, consolidate the list, do some metadata testing first, do some genuine response time testing first with the index as invisible, make sure there's gonna be no regressions for other SQLs, make sure only the SQLs that will benefit will actually be able to, be able to use that index and away we go. So we follow that best practice. And I've got a little diagram here, which I stole from uh, the Optimizer Product Manager slide. So we identify the candidates, create them invisible, compile, rebuild the index unusable, mark them visible, and validation continues for the workload. And then we repeat it every 15 minutes. So that is one of the things that's going to be coming in Oracle 19C. Most probably, and please don't quote me on this, this is my understanding, most probably, initially and maybe even solely on our cloud offerings. Once again, this is something that we wanna be able to manage in terms of how much background work this process will do, how much effort will go in. We need to be very careful in terms of we don't harm people's resource management. We don't wanna have a tool that does a fantastic job creating indexes, but sucks the life out of your server while it's doing it. So certainly initially I'd imagine we'll only be rolling this out on our own cloud where we can very carefully manage and watch and control the resources but maybe at some stage in future with 19, it will actually be available across all versions of 19. But either way, I think the 19C stuff is way cool. The only thing you'll need to set for that is some preferences. So these are the kind of preferences. Do you want to exclude some schemas from the automatic job? Do you want to, um, for example, do just some reporting? That's the index mode. I put two in red, and this is why I wanted to touch on these um, preferences. There'll be auto index retention for auto. What does that mean? That means the automatic monitor will obviously come up with a list of indexes to add from time to time. These are what we call automatically added indexes. What will happen, of course, is over time, we'll add more and more indexes. But also, if those automatically created indexes are not used for a period of time, for example, say a month or two months, et cetera, then we will drop them. So we're not just like saying, here's five more indexes, and then next week, here's 15 more indexes, and you get this enormous soup of indexes. What we're doing is we'll actually 
ad indexes, and then as they drop off usage, for example, your applications may change or just the queries that were monitored may only run very infrequently, then we'll actually drop those indexes. So we're actually trying to self-manage here as well. The second preference is a bit more interesting for us as DBAs on the call, which is auto index retention for manual. And if you're suspicioning what that is, is that yes, we will at the moment, we can go drop indexes that you have created. Yes, that is also a feature of the new automatic indexes. Not will it only monitor its own automatic indexes, it'll monitor yours as well. Now, out of the box, we set that to I think over a year. So we're gonna be very, very generous in terms of leaving manually created indexes on. But just to let you know that this is our long-term goal, the fact that the database should be able to come up with an adequate indexing strategy, no matter whether the indexes it's created or indexes that you've created, which I think, you know, um, I'd imagine we'll have some, you know, some care and attention pushed on this. And one of the things you can do when this thing comes out is run it just in a reporting mode, as opposed to actually doing it. But so far, most of the tests we've done on some benchmarks seem to suggest that the automatic indexing is doing a better job than manually created regimes. Now, I know that's just a wave of my hand and you might be skeptical and that's fine. I'm a big fan of skepticism because the more holes and things you can poke in these things, the more robust we can make it. Um, one of the things I like about this is in terms of development um, for your developers now, they can, with a lot more confidence, build applications which is, Give me just the primary key indexes, give me maybe the foreign key indexes, roll my application out, as opposed to then spending a lot of time thinking of other indexes that might be needed for performance. They can roll out with the core set of indexes that help define the data integrity of the database. And let's face it, that's a good thing if we can even get there. And then we can actually look at the database itself coming up with appropriate indexing strategies based on real-time production use. That's pretty cool. At which point are you going, thanks a lot, Connor, but 19C is not even available yet, except for you know, out on a few websites like Live SQL. What am I going to do now? So I mentioned dropping of indexes. Let's, let's focus on dropping of indexes. I, I, I think I've safely covered creating it, even if you're doing it with it before 19C, because I've given you that 10-step process. Hopefully, you'll follow as many of those steps as possible. Maybe all 10, that'd be great. But if some, even some is better than, than just slamming an index in. So let's talk about dropping an index, because... This is perhaps a more realistic situation as DBAs that we encounter. And that is, you know, we have a table and obviously it comes in with a primary key. And then someone might say, well, I need to query my sales table on customers. So you have a customer index. And then I need to query my sales table on, for example, the most recent sales. So I have a sale date index. And then I query on product and I have a product index. And of course, you can see what actually happens what happens is more and more and more and more indexes get created to solve particular problems, sometimes long-term, sometimes short-term, sometimes emergency. Um, Dennis had just popped a question in the chat saying, is the automatic index management a feature for cloud-based, I, I assume it's cloud-based, not could-based autonomous database? Uh, yes, certainly initially, we'll be doing it on our own cloud, our own machines, um, but it may one day head out to the on-premise world as well uh, once it's been very, very thoroughly embedded in on our own systems. Returning to the spaghetti diagram you can see there, we have this, as I said, spaghetti of indexes. And of course, a year after this has happened, someone's gonna go, well, which one of these is still in use? How do we know? And that's one of the challenges. So before 12C, if you're on 11 or below, your options are not great. We used to, this, this thing's been in since Oracle 9, it's called Alter Index Monitoring. And when you turn monitoring usage on for an index, as you can see with that alt command, we put a row into a VDLA view. It's actually a physical table. It's just renamed named as a VDLA view, which actually says, there's my index name. It's monitored, yes, and currently used, no. We've not detected it being used. And then, surprise, surprise, I do a query which would use that primary key index, for example, in this case, and voila, it says, yes, the index has been used now. Now, that initially sounds good, but that's it, that's the only information you got. You didn't get how often it was used, when was the last time it used, that might've happened six years ago. And the only way of resetting that back to no is to actually turn off monitoring, alter index no monitoring, and then turn it back on again, and then wait for the next time. So that in itself, in terms of the quality of the data, it's better than nothing, but it's not spectacular. And that's been there since Oracle 9. And in particular, one of the shortcomings of this was we did that detection at parse time 
So if we saw a usage of that index effectively in the execution plan, that's when we were going to actually say, yep, it's being monitored. So consider this as an example. Here I have a standard child referring back to a parent, a child parent child relationship using a foreign key, using on delete cascade, which means when I delete a row from the parent, I'm going to delete all the child rows associated with that parent row. And of course, to do that, to do it nice and efficiently, I'm probably going to put an index on that child column that refers back to the parent. And that's what I've done with the create index there, foreign key IX on my column. I delete from parent where my primary key equals one. Now let's look at the execution plan for that. It just does an index range scan on the parent primary key. Probably a unique scan, I was lazy with my setup here. But you can see there is nothing in that execution plan, in fact, nothing at all that references the child table. We know, simply due to the referential integrity constraint definition, that that is going to delete on the child table. But because it's not in the execution plan, guess what index monitoring says? Nope, we didn't use it. And therefore, as a DBA, you might then go drop that index. And of course, the next time you try to delete from the parent table, you'll see your familiar hourglass. Dropping that index was actually something you shouldn't have done, but index monitoring gave you a false lead, the fact that it actually might be not be used. So there are some risks there. So what are your options if you're before 12C? Obviously, even though I seem to be a bit scathing there about index monitoring. It's a useful tool. It gets you started. It gives you some information that yes, it's probably being used. To go better, one of the things I like doing is um, you can query Vidola SQL plan. And if you're licensed for AWR, DBA HIS SQL plan. And obviously there's an object name column in there, which just that's the object name you see when you look at execution plans. So you can simply do a distinct list of all the objects in there and out of join it to your indexes table. Over time, you'll build up a list of all the indexes that have been found in execution plans. You would have to run this reasonably frequently, maybe you know, every 10, 15 minutes or so, depending on how fast things are getting aged out of your shared pool. But that is the way of doing it in the sense that you can simply say, okay, I'll get a list of all the objects that have, all the index objects that have been used in the lifetime of this instance. And then at least I know that anything that is never touched they're probably my most obvious candidates for at least making invisible initially to make sure they don't drop and then actually maybe um, getting rid of them. And that's sort of what I got for the last one. Your other option really before 12 is to grab an index that you think is not being used, make it invisible and then wait for the phone to ring, you know, see, see who screams. Um, at least then because it's only invisible, if the alarm bells do go off, it is just a case of doing alter index visible as opposed to having to rebuild that index. So invisible index is one of the things that I find is very underused. I would always create my indexes invisible and then do a regression test. And I'd always drop my indexes by doing alter index invisible first. Leave it on for a month. I mean, after all, if you've had it there for a while anyway, you're already accepting the performance overhead of that index. So make it invisible, leave it for a month. If no one, if no one complains, then you can drop it with a lot more safety. In 12C, we realized that maybe invisible plus screaming is uh, not the ideal solution for index monitoring. So we delivered this thing called DBA index usage. It's a much more detailed set of information. It's a histogram style of information for the way indexes are used. I've got some sample data here. And although it's not immediately obvious, this is when I did the delete from the parent which invoked the delete cascade on the child table, just to prove the fact that even though we didn't do it, we didn't, um, we didn't see the index usage for the child table in past time, we actually did execute with the index and the new system we have for monitoring indexes actually picked it up. You can see that we got the number of times it was actually accessed, the number of rows, and those bucket columns are like a bit of a histogram information in terms of the kind of distribution we're having in terms of the number of executions and number of rows related per execution. So that's pretty cool. And the one I love best, obviously, is the last used column, which actually shows you the last time this index was used in the execution of any SQL. So it's about execution now. That's one thing I want to stress. It's not just was the index detected in a parse. It actually has to be used in an execution. And that's obviously far better. That's something you're probably much more interested in. Having said that, having said, isn't this so cool? It's not just parsing, it's about execution. This is a tool to help you not replace you. 
And you know, in the world of autonomous databases, DBAs are constantly freaking out about, oh, it's gonna put me out of a job, which is a nonsense. I'll be talking about that um, at some talks, probably all this year, um, most notably next week. But this is a good example. We're giving you more information, but it's designed to help you not replace you because indexes can be involved in more than just execution. So an index might be valuable even if you never execute a code with that index. Let me give you some examples. Example one is the optimizer. Let's look at this query. I've got a table called T1 and the specifics are really unimportant, but the key thing is that query at the bottom of the screen. Select count star from T1 where C1 is 12 and C2 is 12 and there's 200 rows. So we know this in advance. We know the actual correct result is 200. Let's look at the optimizer plan for that same query. The optimizer got it totally wrong. It's doing table access for, there's no indexes on this table. And it's saying, well, there's four rows. We know there's 200, so that optimizer thing is out by a factor of 50. It's like miles out. So the issue is the optimizer by default doesn't understand the correlation between columns. It doesn't know that I created the data in such a way that there's a correlation between columns C1 and C2. It assumes some defaults and therefore we come up with an estimate of four rows, which is miles out. Now I create an index on that table called T1, C1 and C2. Look at my optimizer plan now. Notice it's not using the index, but it did get the estimate correct now. So even though we didn't use the index for execution, the optimizer managed to use some of the statistics on the index to come up with a better execution estimate even though it ended up being a full table scan. So if I was to drop that index, the optimizer would then be led astray back to that estimate of four. So that index is actually in this case important, not for its usage, but for its statistics. Now, obviously we could overcome that by using extended statistics, which has been around for a long time. But my point is just dropping an index because it hasn't been used might create issues that you see just there. You might actually change some execution plans. The second example is fairly obvious. Most people are familiar with foreign key locking issues. They get more and more efficient with each version of Oracle. The days of tables being locked for entire transactions are gone, but the reality is we still have to do some locking on foreign key relationship columns between parent and child tables. DBA index usage is not gonna pick that up. If you're just using index for locking, it does not appear in DBA index usage. And the final one, which I wanna stress to, this is the one I wanted to get to in terms of using this as a tool to assist you as opposed to just not putting any thought into it is DBA index uses can give you some false negatives and false positives. Now, by default, this, these are some examples of why. By default, it's a sampling algorithm. We don't detect every single execution because there's a performance overhead in doing so. Now, that's a parameter you can set, which you'll see in a second, but let's assume now that we weren't. Let's assume we weren't sampling. We actually picked up every single execution you still need to be careful when you're interpreting this data. So first of all, here's a hidden parameter. So obviously you would only use this on the advice of Oracle support. And that is, this is the thing that says, from now on, rather than just sampling index executions, I'm gonna track every single execution of the index. That's gonna have a performance overhead. That's why it's an underscore parameter. But for the sake of this diagram, this demonstration, we can be confident that we're tracking every single execution of an index. I've created a table called T on the second line and I've created an index on the object ID column. Now this is all I'm doing. I'm doing gather table stats. That's the only thing I've done on this table. Then I go look at DBA index uses and as you'd expect, you would expect that there are no rows in there because we haven't done index executions. That's number one false negative. The reason there are no rows in there is because we only flush that information out every 15 minutes. And if you're thinking, oh, I might call DBMS stats flush database monitoring info, it's unhooked from that. It's not part of that. At, to my knowledge, and I've asked some people internally, they, they tell me the same currently, there is no way of flushing that information out. It is every 15 minutes. So even if I had done some queries with indexes on there, you would actually still see no rows in there. You have to wait for that 15 minute flush. So just querying just straight off the bat is not something you can just rely on immediately. So I wrote this little utility here, and all it does is it queries the V$ index usage info view, which shows you the last time that information was flushed out, and I simply wait for that to change. So it waited about 10 or 15 minutes, and then it said, yep, there's definitely been a flush now. 
Now, as I said, all we've done so far is gather stats on the table, and this is the interesting result. Now I look at that same DBA view, and as it currently stands in all versions of Oracle where this is active, things like DBMS stats actually do use the index because one of the things it does do is do an index fast full scan throughout all the rows to work out some index statistics, some index, let's, let me try that again with a few less Xs. What DBMS stats does do is does a full index scan to pick up some index statistics to store in DBA in columns, etc. So this is something that I'm, I'm not proud of. I'm not critical of this and I think we'll probably fix it. But as it currently stands, you should know that simply gathering stats on a table that has indexes will record information that the index was used because in reality it was by that DBMS stats call. So you need to take these things with a grain of salt. So my overriding thing here is let's be careful. Okay. It's good information. It's good extra information and DBA end usage, but you need to use it to make intelligent decisions. Whew, quick drink for me. 836. This is a disaster. Okay. SQL velocity. Time to amp up the speed. We have a system that generates SQL statements. Can we use DBMS SQL pass to ensure that they are valid before they run them? And all I can say to that is it's complicated. Um, and so I thought I'd show you a demo as to why that is actually complicated. So let's do a new share. Let's bring up this one. This is the one I want. Hopefully everyone can see that. Hopefully the font's large enough. And I called it OC pars, didn't I? So I thought I'd show you this first as where the motivation for DBMS SQL comes in. Now, that's obviously a lot to digest on one screen. This is a script I use to actually show you some of the results you've seen in previous slides about printing out columns from a table as rows down the screen. And you actually, this is the query I use. And really all you need to look at here in this slide, as you can see, I take a query just defined as a parameter. I parse the query, just to the one line, I parse the query to make sure it's valid. And then I do a describe columns, and then I can actually loop through the columns, do some fetching, and print out each column a row at a time. So we can actually do a little example of this. So let's run it. It'll ask me for a query. I do select star from scott.emp, and hopefully if I type everything right, you can see scott.emp comes out, but it comes out as rows down the screen. That's just the utility we use in Ask Tom because often we have to print out information and we don't want people to have to scroll. 37,000 miles across the screen. So you can see that the key part here is we have a query that comes in, but the key line is we use DBMS SQL pars as part of DBMS SQL to actually see if a query is going to work and to get information about it. So it seems tangible that you could actually, or plausible, that you could use this to test the validity of SQLs. And you can in the main, let's have a look. So let's start with a simple one, select star from user objects. So in theory, that's a correct SQL. Can I parse it just with a parse call, nothing else? Yes, I can, I don't get any errors. So, so far, so good. And then let's try the negative of that. I'm doing select star from something that doesn't exist, select star from the wrong name. I run that and I get an error. So far, so good. So for basic select statements, dbmsql.parse is going to be fine for testing the validity. Let's now create a table called T. And what happens if I try parse DDL? So now I've just got drop table T. Is that a valid statement or not? Well, it says, yes, it was valid. But here's problem number one, or issue number one, or things to be aware of number one with dbmsql.parse. When you parse DDL, you run the DDL. So you can see my table is gone because it actually ran the drop table command. So Got to be super careful with DDL. You can't test a DDL to see if it's valid without actually running it. Um, one exception to that is you can do an explain plan for create table as select, an explain plan for create index, and it'll give you the execution plan without running those two commands, but that's the only two that I know of. Um, you can't do a parse on a truncate because it'll actually run the truncate. Let's now look at things like anonymous blocks. So I've got here a peel SQL block, very basic one, declare a variable, set it to 10, etc. Yes, you can parse that as well. That's cool. Let's now parse 
an anonymous block that calls a non-existing procedure. I've got a procedure here called gibberish, and as you can see, that works as well. So it's doing a reasonable job with PL SQL code as well. Let's now look at anonymous blocks with no PL SQL calls in them, right? Except one slight change here. Now I've got a bind variable. And systems that generate SQL on the fly, I would generally hope contain references to bind variables because if you're just generating SQL with literals, there's a very good chance you're setting yourself up for SQL injection problems here. So obviously, as we all know, we have to be incredibly careful when we're doing generating SQLs from user input anyway. Um, but even if you have a system that's doing it, then obviously we want to be using bind variables. So that works fine. That's looking good so far. Let's now do this. I've got a bind variable and it equals, but it's wrong and it, incorrect. So it seems to handle bind variables as well. That's no dramas. Let's take it up a notch. Now I'm calling this non-existent routine and I'm passing a bind variable as a parameter. Well, that's unexpected. And what's going on here? One of the things that we do in the PL SQL engine is we decide when something needs to be fully checked for correctness. Now, if you have a anonymous block that is syntactically correct, like the one there, it actually is theoretically compilable if gibberish came into existence, but it has a bind variable, then we actually won't do the full parsing that's after the syntactic until execution time. So that's why it says it's fine, because what we're doing is we don't really know whether this is valid or not until we know the full definition of the bind variable. We might need to know its data type, etc. So until we can compare, for example, data types of the binds with the data types of the parameters, we don't really know. So this is what I wanted to stress to you. It's very, very important to realize that if you start using binds inside PL SQL blocks, parsing them is actually deferred to execution time. So just getting that result of saying successfully completed shows that it actually is incorrect because that is actually not going to run. So just to extend it, I've got, you know, it's not just that, I've got junk, more junk, et cetera, et cetera, right? We have these problems just because I've got this assignment to a bind variable in here. So trying to work around it by declaring it locally and then referencing it as a local variable doesn't matter. The moment you've got that bind in there, Right, and you're using a PLC anonymous block, if it's syntactically correct, it's not going to get really any further than that. So just want to let people know that's a, an issue that you need to be aware of. Um, I've actually logged an enhancement request um, to actually have some means for developers to do a, or what I would call a full parse of, of any piece of Oracle text um, that's in the system. Um, obviously, it'll be prioritized and accepted or rejected accordingly. So just so I'll let you know, what else have I got here? Um, if it is a function, you can actually get a little bit better by doing select your function name with the bind from dual and you will actually pick it up. The SQL engine will actually do a more complete parse, even though the bind is there. I think that's everything. So just thought I'd let you know that. Um, testing SQL validity, you can do it in the main using DBMS SQL parse, as in most, op most facilities, but there are a few uh, edge cases there you need to be aware of. Thankfully, we covered that one nice and quickly. Quick drink. So um, your options are, if I'm writing a, a, a utility that actually accepts generated SQL, things I'd probably be doing anyway is making sure the only thing you're allowed to do are selects. I mean, maybe insert, delete, update, but reality, I mean, I'm thinking, man, I don't want to generate, generating things that automatically change my data, I think is risky. So maybe only allowing selects um, and obviously maybe therefore Encouraging binds, but no binds in PL SQL anonymous blocks. Obviously, what we're really saying is there's really no absolute 100% guarantee the moment you head into anonymous block territory. Number three, cursor sharing. What is the best solution for cursor sharing, exact or force, or is it always better to use a bind variable? Yes, but I'm assuming here that people are exploring cursor sharing only because they can't get access to use bind variables all the time, in particular third party apps. I'm, not, I'm only looking for performance, not security. In adaptive cursor sharing, if you're using cursor sharing force and ACS, are they, will they, are they compatible? Will they work side by side? And is it costly, et cetera? So I thought we'd have a look at some of the interesting things with cursor sharing and adaptive cursor sharing. Um, 
One thing I will stress um, for anyone who's on the call, I'm not sure if our, the person who asked this is on the call, but even if they're not, I would strongly advise against ever putting that sentence into any question you ever post <laughs> or any statement you ever make. Um, the number one thing for 2019 and probably beyond is security. You know, you can have a slow app and people will, you know, they'll whinge and complain and phone you. If you get a hacked app that's been hacked by someone, right, then you're toast. Your, your career's over, your company's through. So yeah, so the concept of I care about performance over and above sec over security, yeah, that's, that's a bad idea. I wouldn't put that sentence anywhere. But anyway, I digress. Let's look at some demos here. So the time is running out. Or am I going to get through? I hope so. We'll see how we go. So ACS, uh, new share. So I'm going to create a table with a whole stack of columns. They're going to use it throughout our demo. So the really only important one is the fact that there's a primary key, which is the uh, it's an integer. The rest are just dumb bar chart twos. So I'm going to put 500,000 rows in there. And it's going to be very skewed data. You can sort of see from the case statement that actually almost all the rows are actually the value of 20. And there's just, um, there are others with just a scattering of 50 distinct values. So we actually have the values 1 through 50 each once. And then the value of 20, like 499,000 times. I'm going to create an index, gather some stats, gather some histograms. You can see we're actually, oh, that one might have been a bit fast, sorry. You can see we've actually created a frequency histogram on the column called PK, which is our one of interest. And we can actually do a query that shows the distribution of the data. So even though I went fast over this, we can actually look at this query. This is the distribution, I'll scroll up a bit. The values one, two, three, four, et cetera, all occur only once. Does my mouse appear on the screen? Yeah. The value of 20 occurs 499,000 times, and they occur once. So, a very, very distinct skew on the value of 20 there. So let's flush the share pool so we start afresh. And let's do select query where primary key equals 10. Now that's a literal. There's nothing to do with cursor sharing here. So as you'd expect, ah, oh, what? Ah, oh, I've got server output on. We don't want that. Hold on a sec. I'm going to have to kill this guy off. And we'll go again. Hopefully. Plus the share pool, max 10. No, I've got server output on somewhere. That's a disaster. Got to get rid of that. Got to get rid of that um, without losing too much time. Oh. Oh, messing with demos on the fly is a bad idea. One moment. Let's see what we got. So this off, okay. I may have, may have a bug in the demo here. We'll see how we go. Somewhere. Old system plus shared pool. Select max data. That's better. Okay. Where were we? Okay, so I did select from equals 10. 10 is a very, very small occurring value. And so we're using the index range scan. If I do select from primary key equals 20, that's the one with bazillion rows, then we get table access full. It made that differentiation because we have the histogram on both these columns, which is pretty cool. Let's flush the shared pool. Now, I'm doing this setup here actually for later. I'm now gonna introduce a whole stack of bind variables because adaptive cursor sharing is about bind variables and to some extent histogram, not always, but to some extent. So, all these V2 up to V15, I'm just setting to X and forgetting about them. We don't have to worry about it. They're just basically all set to X. What's more interesting is bind variable number one, because we're going to use that to do queries into our primary key column. So I'm doing this now. I've got primary key equals V01 using the value of 10. So we're hoping for an index because it's a very infrequent value, plus a few other binds, et cetera, and we get run row back. And as we expected, we got an index range scan. So we're happy with that. Now here's where adaptive cursor sharing comes in. If I look at 
VL SQL, I've got three critical columns. Is bind sensitive, is bind aware, is shareable. That particular SQL is bind sensitive. The database has seen that, that the value of 10 in that bind variable of VO1 is critical in terms of how we actually do the execution plan. So this SQL is sensitive to changes in bind variables. It's currently shareable, which means other SQL, other values of the bind variable can use it, but it is sensitive to it. So let's now proceed onwards. Now I'll go with the value of 20, which we know ideally would be table access full because there's so many of them. So I run it, it did an index range scan. So this is the thing with adaptive cursor sharing. The first invocation it says, yep, okay, I've got a plan that already works for that. I know it works, it's the index range scan, but I did mark it as bind sensitive. So what happens is as I repeatedly run this query for the bind variable of 20, a few more times, because that thing was bind sensitive, now when I go query my V$ SQL table, I've got two queries in there. This is the original one. It's bind sensitive. It's the one that we're using index range scan. It's no longer shareable. So what happens is this is the one that we were using, just the index range scan. And the database said, look, forget that one. We don't want him anymore. Here's a brand new version of the same cursor. It is bind sensitive. It's now aware of the binds that are coming in and therefore is shareable. As a result, when I run this query using the bind value of 20, it is now using table access full. So that's what adaptive cursive sharing is in a nutshell. It's saying, even though I'm running the exact same SQL, the difference in bind variables, sorry, the difference in values that go into the bind variable can have an impact on the execution plan. Therefore, I can actually adapt the cursor to it, adaptive cursor sharing. Let's fuss the shared pool again. Here's where things start getting interesting. Here I have pretty much the exact same scenario, just a slightly different query. I'm setting value of bind equal 10 as before. The query is just different now. I'm using a whole stack of binds. These are all X, remember? They're, they're pretty much always true. So that's gonna be deciding between indexes or full table scan. So I get an index range scan. Let's look at the state of that SQL. It says for that new SQL, which has all these binds in it, it's not bind sensitive. Well, that's a pain because we know that the moment we change the value in V1, V01, that it actually is bind sensitive. Let's run it again. Maybe we need to run it a couple more times. Guess what? Still not bind sensitive. This is something I discovered when I was playing around with ACS today in the sense that certain scenarios of queries, once you get more than say, I think it's from my estimates here, I think more than 14 bind variables, adaptive curse sharing will not come into play at all, no matter what. So if you've got a whole stack of binds, ACS isn't gonna help you. Here's one we go to V20 now. So ideally this would have been adaptive, but as you can see, uh, it doesn't matter how many times I run it, it's still insensitive. It actually uses the index in all cases, even though we didn't want it to. So that's a critical thing to remember. When you have more than 14 bind variables, ACS doesn't come in. Now we're so late on time that we had more to say on ACS. I had a whole stack of more demos. Um, I think I'm just gonna have to read them to you because I wanna get to a whole lot of stuff which we're not gonna get to. ACS2, which I won't run, if you have a huge number of columns in your query, I think it's more than nine, um, where column one equals something, and column two equals something, and column three equals something, ACS doesn't come into play as well. So think to remember here. And the final one, ACS3, which we'll go through, maybe next month we'll do the rest of the ACS, is that is even if cursor sharing is turned on, then on the um, queries that come in that get converted from literals to binds, adaptive cursor sharing will still come into play for them as well. So that's that. Now, the reason I'm gonna skip multiple block sizes, even that's a question, is because we wanna talk about this. I got five minutes left. Everyone's been saying, oh, 19C's come out. It's all over Twitter. So I thought I'd whet your appetite with a last little bit of 19C stuff. Now, if you wanna play with 19C yourself, you can head right now over to livesql.oracle.com. It's running 19C. You can start running some demos on 19C and start playing with these things. There's a few. I tweeted a couple today, but I thought, you know, 
Do I have it in here? I think, what's it called? I'll share a new screen. Oh, sorry, I haven't, I didn't share my screen back, did I? That's no good. 19C and head over to nightlivec or oracle.com. That was a bit silly not sharing that, but that's because I was too excited about 19. Let's show you just before we finish. This is my local version of 19C. I think I called it 19C demo. So I thought I'd show you a couple of 19 things to get you excited about 19C. And the reason I stress just a couple is 19C isn't about a bazillion new features. I want to stress that. There's literally a handful of brand new features in 19C. There's maybe dozens of tweaks and improvements to existing features. And all the other time is pretty much spent on making the thing more stable, more secure, fixing bugs. This is why 19C I'm super pumped on because the focus inside Oracle has been on let's make this rock solid um, in terms of security, stability, bugs, etc. Let's make it rock solid in terms of completing existing functionality. And here's a first example of that. We've all seen the list ag function. Looks great. Okay, looks list ag. But what if there's duplicates? You know, in department 30, there's four people who are salesmen. How do I get rid of those duplicates? Well, you can't. And that sort of sucks. And it's a real and it really sucks when if you have a lot of duplicates. Oh, here I'm doing all the object types within a particular owner out of all objects. Now, obviously, there's thousands of tables. So the word table appears thousands of times in my list ag aggregation. Well, I then get, I blow up the number of results. 19C, you can add a distinct keyword now in list ag. Oh, double thumbs up, fantastic. So it works there, for example, you've just got the one salesman now. And now this query, which was crashing before, being too long, now actually has for each owner all the distinct set of object types. So that in itself, yeah, that is worth the price of upgrading, I reckon, just to get list ag distinct, that's super cool. Other cool things in terms of finishing off the implementation. JSON object came in in 12.2, but if you wanted to build a JSON object, you had to list the columns, the key values, et cetera, what, how you wanted to construct the JSON. 19C, nice, sorry, 18C, 19C, a nice little extension, just pass the star in and you get the JSON fragment straight out of the box. All the columns, all the values, nice and simple. Now, each one of these is a JSON fragment. What if I wanna actually aggregate them all into just a single JSON document? Well, I can use JSON array ag. That, that's, that's, that's not a new thing in 19C, that's been there for a long time. That gives me a big giant club and you can see it started to wrap all over the screen, et cetera, it's hard to read. So in 19C, JSON serialize a way of taking JSON structures and returning them as blobs, blobs, et cetera, and prettying them up as well. How cool is that? And there we go, the same structure now, nicely cleaned up in how you'd like to see your JSON. That's nice. And one more, just to get you excited, we've only got a couple minutes left, but one more gets you excited, just to show you that 19C is real. Um, hopefully this one, this is a beta of 19C. I'm, not, I'm using one that's quite old, but we're generally familiar with the concept of external tables. They came in way back in Oracle 9. Here's a table called T external. And one of the nice things in Oracle 19, and I think 18 as well, is you can be very loose with actually the definition. I've simply said, that's where you find it, and it's a CSV file. All the other stuff we used to normally have to write, I've left out here, and it just works. That's a nice thing in itself. This is actually just a file on the file server, and it just, as you can see, it's pretty unexciting. But also in 19C, I can now have a table which is half external tables, half real tables. So I've got a table called hybrid partitions. First of all, I define how my external objects will be inside this hybrid partition table. So the external partition will have the following attributes. They're loader files, they come from directory temp. Then I partition as per normal. But look at this, partition number one is actually external that CSV file where the partition key is the value X to part. Another partition is just a normal standard partition. So now I can, for example, insert, even though it's a table which is half external, half internal, or half real, I can still in insert stuff into the normal Oracle part. Obviously I can't insert into the external part, but that's a really cool feature because now I can have a table which is part Oracle, part external. That external could be a CSV file. 
It could be something from block storage. It could be on Hadoop, a great way of bringing together multiple different data stores and even data technologies, perhaps. So that's super cool. And hopefully that gets you very pumped about 19C. So it's time to wrap up. Oh, look, I've finished right at nine o'clock. When I say finished nine o'clock, what I mean is I skipped a third of the stuff we were meant to cover. So my apologies always. Um, I just get too much into it, too excited about it, and time runs over. So we only have an hour. Maybe we'll have to start doing longer office hours sessions. I'll finish off with, anyway, happy new year, everyone. Glad to have you back on office hours. And uh, we'll see you somewhere around the world. Uh, if you want me to talk at your local user group, please reach out. I'll see if we can swing something up. And um, we'll see how we go. So 901, thanks, everyone. Uh, if you have more questions, bang them on Twitter to me, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks, everyone. Good night.